All right. Welcome, everyone. This is Ken McKenzie, the manager of the Master Planning Program at the Urban Drainage and Flood Control District. And today's webinar is to talk about the, uh, the statewide compliance portal for the Colorado Stormwater Detention and Infiltration Facilities. I'm going to be giving just a brief demo. I'm going to turn it over to Carlin Armstrong from the State Engineer's Office, who's going to talk about the new uh, statewide, the, the new State Engineer's Administrative Memorandum, talking about, talking specifically about what is and what is not included for the notification portal. And then we're going to open it up for questions. There are two handouts with this webinar, and you should be able to access those. From your screen and if you have questions during this I want you to do one of two things you can hold up your hand and I'll try to get to you we have so many people on the line uh, it's going to be very difficult and everyone by default is muted so if you hold up your hand and, and we will have time at the end for questions I'll try to get to you but a better way to do it in my opinion would be to use the question uh, part of the interface and actually type in a question. That way, even if we don't get to you during this hour and a half webinar, uh, it will be recorded and we will, we will follow up with you on your question and your comment to make sure that these all get addressed. We are recording this webinar also and that's going to be made publicly available uh, within a couple of days of this. So I have Holly Pisa on the line as well. Holly works with me at Urban Drainage and Flood Control District and Carlin Armstrong with the State Engineer's Office. I'm just going to go ahead and get right started. So you should see on your screen right now, and Holly, please confirm that they do see the compliance portal on your screen. It looks good, yep. Okay, so, so this is the compliance portal. You can see the URL up at the top. This is where the general public will go to, to look at stormwater facilities and determine whether they feel it's an impact to their water rights or not. This is where the development engineers will go to upload stormwater management facilities, and this is where the local jurisdictions will go to accept or approve those facilities into the database. So from the general public's perspective, uh, I as a water right holder on the state's uh, substitute water supply plan email list for the South Platte River will get an email once a week if there are new facilities in the South Platte River watershed. You can see there are a bunch of them here. And that email will direct me, will have hyperlinks for each one of the new facilities. And so I can click on that hyperlink and it will take me right to the facility. So let's say I'm in the South Platte River watershed. I get an email, it tells me there are two new facilities in the town of Loveland. I click on the link and it takes me right to, I'm sorry, city of Loveland. It takes me right to the city of Loveland to, to one of these facilities. You may notice there are green and there are blue facilities. The green icons are pending approval from the local jurisdiction. The blues have already been approved. So I'm not, as a water rights holder on the, on the email list, I'm not going to get notification of a green facility. Only after it's been approved by the local jurisdiction will that email go out. So I click on the facility and I, I click on show details and it tells me this is in the Redwood Business Park. It's a 100-year design storm facility. Here at Galloway uh, is the engineer that did the design on it. And uh, the water surface, the pond and water surface is 0.37 acres. Part of the statute requires us to demonstrate that this facility does indeed drain in 72 hours or less for the five-year storm. That's accomplished by a, a workbook that we created for that purpose. So here's the PDF of the workbook that was uploaded to the website. And as the water rights holder, I can look at this. Hopefully I'm baffled by its brilliance. I look at this output table and I see that the time to drain the five year is, uh, is 56 hours, which is, means that it complies with the state statute. The time to drain the 100 year is 61 hours. So again, it is in full compliance. And the total ponding area is 0.37 acres. So this all this all looks good. Uh, this facility has complied with the new state statute. So that's what it looks like from the general water rights holders perspective. Now, as a design engineer, I know I'm going by through this very fast and it will be recorded so you can 
view this later on in the leisure. But if I am a development engineer and I need to upload a facility, let's say I'm in the town of Crook out on the eastern plains of Colorado, way out on the eastern plains of Colorado, and I have a facility that I want to upload there, and I'm doing this out there because uh, I don't want to get in trouble with any of my friends at the local jurisdictions here in the area when I, when I create a facility that doesn't really exist. I'm going to turn on the world, the, uh, the, the aerial imagery so I can see exactly where my site is. Zoom in, and this is where I'm going to put my detention basin right here. So I want to add a new facility. I click on add a new facility. Before proceeding, it says I should download the SWI data sheet. Uh, so that I can upload that later on. I'm going to click yes on that. It's downloading it to my computer. I'm going to take this opportunity to open the, the data that I've already prepared for this. So you can see I have some basic watershed information, the slope, the length, the area, the imperviousness, and the soil type of the watershed. These are all required to, to demonstrate compliance. And I have a stage area and discharge table and you have to have those as well. So before you go to upload one of these one of these workbooks you need to have that information available. Going back to the website, my workbook is downloaded. I open it up. It's a fairly large workbook. It takes a minute to open. I enable the content. I'm going to to uh, look at both my workbooks at the same time so I can transfer information. So I put in the, in the watershed information that I prepared. Of course, I prepared it in the right order, which makes my job a lot easier than, uh, than yours will be if you have, don't have it prepared in this, in this order. I'm going to go ahead and um, get this information ready to enter. And I put the information into the workbook. Everything looks good. I select a rain gauge. I don't really have, uh, if I had rainfall for the town of Crook, I would use that. I didn't prepare that for this demonstration, so I'm just going to use the default rainfall. And for my water quality method, this is a, uh, a full spectrum detention basin, which means it also incorporates extended detention. So I select that. Now I notice many of you are using an older version of this workbook, and I would recommend that you download the newest version of the workbook and use that instead. It does have some enhancements. I click on process the data. It, uh, it's done. The data has been processed. I can see from the graph that this is a, definitely a good peak shaving detention basin. It takes these really large inflow hydrographs from the six acre site and takes them down to uh, a much lower, much more manageable flow rate. I look at the depth of ponding and it, it, it agrees with uh, the same basic concept there. I look at the output table. I see that 97% of the five year storm drains in 57 hours, 99% of the 100 year storm drains in 57 and a half hours. The total ponding area is 0.25 acres. This looks great. I'm going to print this so that I can upload it to the portal. I'll save it as a PDF, which I think it already actually did. Save that and go back to the portal and let's finish doing the, the update worksheet completed. So I'm going to put a pin on the map and drop it right there in the middle of that site. It populates the jurisdiction, the watershed, I'll call this Crook, full spectrum detention, pond number one, because we might have a second phase to the study. The design storm for full spectrum detention is the 100 year. And I know from my workbook that the ponding area is 0.25 acre, acres. I'm going to upload my spreadsheet that I saved. And I'm going to put my email address in. And I'm going to hit save. It's loading. 
takes a minute. You can see the icon is now green, which means it's pending the acceptance by the town of Crook. And I get a notice saying it's been created. I say OK. Now it will be sending me, the, the portal will be sending me an email telling me that, uh, that this has been loaded into the database and it will give me the information that I need to modify that later on. I'm getting some feedback from someone on the line. Yeah, good. Okay, so it's doing that good job. And I don't see that email, but it'll be coming in just a minute. So I don't want to hold this, this webinar up while I'm waiting for the email. <clears throat> Sorry about the feedback on the line. I'm not sure where that's coming from. All right, so that's how it looks from the development engineer's perspective. I get the email, it has a password, so I can go back in later on and I can modify this. You have to have the password to do that. Now, from the local jurisdiction's perspective, you will log in with your credentials, which have been given to you. If you don't have them, contact me and I will get them to you. Each community has one log, one email login, or, or one login name and one set of credentials. So I just logged in with my set of credentials, which are adequate for the town of Crook. I'm the acting city engineer. I click on this site and I say edit facility. And at this point, if I disagree with, with that this should even be in the database or it's in the wrong place or I have an issue with it, I can either contact the engineer of record, I can delete the facility, uh, or I can just leave it there until a later date. Now, if I don't do anything with it for 30 days, it will automatically be accepted into the database. So you have 30 days to do something with this. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and delete it because that's that's all you needed to see. Once I, If I did accept it, then it would be permanently in the database, but it would only be visible to the general user for 90 days. And it vanishes from the general user, general user after 90 days. So I delete this facility, yes, okay, and so if you want to see the facilities that are no longer visible to the general user, you can do this uh, on the toolbar, I'm sorry, it's actually on the layers. Uh, you can select the archived facilities as well, and I'll show you what it looks like when the archived facilities are also loaded. So you can see, zooming in, you can see the ones that are grayish black are the archive facilities. All right, so that's that's the the compliance portal in a nutshell. And I know you probably have a lot of questions, and we'll get to those questions. Uh, but first, I want to turn it over to Carlin Armstrong from the State Engineer's Office. And Carlin, I'd like to have you describe to us the new uh, administrative memorandum, which I'll bring up on the screen. Great. Thanks, Ken. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. My name is Carlin Armstrong. I'm a water resource engineer with the Division of Water Resources, and I'm, as Ken mentioned, here to introduce DWR's new administrative statement regarding the management of stormwater detention facilities. Ken has up on the screen there. Before I get started, I just wanted to give a huge shout out to Ken and his entire team for um, taking the lead on this on this initiative and working with us as we developed this document. We were really excited for the opportunity to be working so closely with them. So a little bit of background about why this document was created. As many of you know, we had a previously had an administrative position that allowed for stormwater detention for 72 hours for on-site detention. Um, however, we did not have the um, statutory authority to extend the allowance to regional detention facilities or beyond that 72 hours. Um, so in 2015, legis legislation was brought forth and signed um, Senate Bill 212, and the Act provides specific direction for the administration of detention facilities and creates avenues for those structures to be exempt from administration by our office under the prior appropriation system. Um, and Ken has done a great job helping everybody navigate those avenues going forward. So in 
So this document is really in response to that legislation and supersedes our previous administration, administrative statement about stormwater management. So a little bit about the document itself. Um, the structure of the document has an introduction that is general across the board. And then from there is broken up into two sections. There's one section on stormwater detention facilities and a second section on post-wildland fire facilities. Um, this Senate Bill 212 addressed both types of facilities. So this document um, talks about both. However, for your purposes, you're really just going to be interested in the introduction and that first section on the stormwater facilities. This document really closely mirrors the statutes and it coincides with urban drainage's documents about stormwater facilities and the administration of them. Um, however, there are several points of interest I want to make sure everyone is aware of. The first one is um, to be really careful that the design of these facilities does not expose groundwater. Um, though Senate Bill 212 does exempt many of these facilities from the administration by our office, the exposure of groundwater is still subject to getting a well permit through our office. So really make sure that um, no, no groundwater is being exposed through these facilities. Um, the next one is to make sure that these facilities are designed and operated to meet the statute on the 72-hour limit and 120-hour limit for different design storms. Um, Ken Suite of Tools ensures that the design of these facilities really meets the statutory criteria. However, it's important that whoever is maintaining the, the facility in the future um, take care of it so that it can continue to meet these statutory obligations going forward. We'd really like to avoid any questions about administration of, of any facilities in the future. Now, the last um, point of interest that I'd like to discuss briefly is um, what's not included in Senate Bill 212 and what is not required to be noticed. As Ken has pointed out here on page three, we talk about the type of detention facilities that are contemplated under the statute and the types of detention facilities that are not. So we specifically define the types of detention facilities that are contemplated. Um, primarily, the ones that are not contemplated are associated with construction and non-retention BMPs. Those do not need to be noticed under the statute and are allowed at the discretion of the division engineer. So if you, um, in, in general, any permanent detention facilities do need to be noticed under the statute, any temporary detention facilities do not need to be noticed. Um, if you're not sure whether or not something applies to you, or if you're not sure what the division engineer would think about what you're proposing to do, you are always welcome to call um, us here in the Denver office or our division office staff, and they can help walk you through what's going on, connect you with the, divi with the uh, um, division, other division office staff or the water commissioner to talk through what you're doing in further detail. Um, so that's really the bulk of what I had, Ken. Um, I'm happy to take any questions people might have. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to you. All right, great. Thank you, Carlin. And I do have a couple of questions. Adam Lancaster asked the question, and it's in this paragraph, We and I'll highlight it. So you specifically say, uh, construction BMPs and non-retention BMPs do not require notice. So can you define what is a non-retention BMP? And Holly, feel free to jump in as well. <laughs> That's a good question. So Adam, to keep in mind in general, the ins and outs of the different BMPs that are being used for stormwater um, for stormwater design is not our primary forte. So really our intention there is anything that um, anything that does not meet the definitions above and any sort of detention, sorry, non-retention, um, any sort of permanent BMPs, those really don't don't meet the definitions above and therefore don't require notice. And so that could be on either end. You have your construction BMPs, temporary detention for your on-site construction um, sediment management. Those were 
are going to be allowed at the discretion of the division engineer. If you have permanent retention basins, those are still going to be subject to administration under the priority system. Um, things like permanent wetland creation, any sort of permanent facility that is, is going to hold water for longer than the period allowed under the statute. And that was not the most eloquent answer, but hopefully that sums it up for you. That's good. And I think a good example of a non-retention BMP that would not require notification would be a rain garden. So yep. the things that do require notification are flood control, flood detention basins, extended detention basins, and full spectrum detention basins. So if you have a rain garden that does not also have flood control capacity, then that would not require notification. I think a sand filter is another example of a BMP uh, that, that treats as a flow-through device and, has, and does have a, a surcharge that is metered through the media in a 12-hour period, but it's not retention, it's detention. So there's no flood control, there's a brief period of detention and then filtration. So a sand filter would not require notice. Um, Polly, can you think of any other examples of BMPs that maybe are in a criteria manual that would fall into that? Sounds like I, I lost Holly. I see she's she's muted. All right. Well, I'll 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 brainstorm that and, and continue to think about it. I have another uh, question. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry, Ken. Did you did you have a question for me? Yes, we were saying as far as non-retention BMPs that do not require notification, we included as examples in that group rain gardens and sand filters, and green roofs are. Are, um, are named in the memorandum, but can you think of any other BMPs that might be in our, our criteria manual that would fall into the category that do not require notification? Correct. Okay, good. I'm hearing from a couple of people that I am not coming in very clearly. Is that, uh, is that, is that the experience of other people as well, or is it just looks like maybe just one person? I'm holding the microphone really right up against my lips so that I can't, can't get a lot closer. I'll just speak a little louder and hope that works. Uh, here's, a, here's a question from, uh, where did it go? Joe, Joe Prinster. Joe's asking the question, what exactly does exposed groundwater mean? So when you talk about you can't expose groundwater, what, what exactly are you talking about there? Sure, and that's a great question. Um, exposed groundwater is any time you are excavating and you encounter groundwater so that it is um, available at the surface for evaporation. It's really the, the short answer of that. If you're digging at all and you find the groundwater table and you make that groundwater table um, available to the surface, um, you're exposing groundwater. All right, good. A good example. I know years ago, I won't say where because I don't want Carlin to bust me on this one, but we had a detention basin that we yeah, did not do our homework on as far as get borings and we, we dug a detention basin. It's quite deep, 10 to 12 feet deep. And, uh, and we did hit the groundwater table and it turned into a, a, a wetland. And it's a, yeah. it's a really nice wetland. The birds love it and the deer would like to go down there, but it's totally in violation of water rights and you'll never find it. Huh. I won't. I won't follow up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure we addressed the problem a long time ago. All right. So a lot I'm more sure. questions are, are pouring in here. Justin Wardell with CDOT is asking the question: Media filter drains would not need to be reported, and, and I can answer that question. That's absolutely correct, Justin. There's no detention volume with the, the media filter drain. So this is basically a trench that is filled with an aggregate and has a perforated pipe in it that goes straight to the, the storm drain system or the local creek. And uh, and the water pours off the shoulder of a state highway and, and into a special filtering media that removes pollutants and then takes it to that pipe. So there's no notification required for a media filter drain. That's absolutely correct. Okay, next question. Uh, Dan Mogan is asking, does underground detention not in a vault require compliance be shown? 
And I don't know if you want to handle this. I'll, I'll just give my two cents off right off the top. I'll say yes, it does. It's, it, it's underground, but it is still extended detention. If you're holding it back for a long enough period to provide the settling that removes the, the pollutants, then that is by definition extended detention. So my answer is yes. Carlin, what do you say about that? I I agree with your with your comment on that. And the one other thing I would add to that is any sort of underground detention need to be careful that the design doesn't require any sort of active treatment or pumping process in how you've designed that system, because then it then it wouldn't fall under the statute at all. Uh oh. Right. <laughs> so is it it. it when I consider an extended detention basin, which is clearly listed, um, if it's underground, say in an aggregate, it it detains, but it's it's not an extended detention basin. The way that I read this, um, it's not an underground detention vault, and it's not extend an extended detention basin. So I would interpret that differently but and, and I would actually defer to to Ken and Holly on your interpretation of of what could apply or what could and I think I'm more thinking of um, the requirement that these facilities operate passively and so as long as they can meet that passive operation component okay that's uh that's a topic I think that we're going to have to discuss in, in much greater detail because I know that their underground detention is definitely something that is is on the rise in the, the ultra-urban setting in downtown Denver and, and Aurora and, and the like. And yeah. it's very hard to get the water. Once it's been detained, it's very difficult to get it out of the, the basement of a building, for example, without pumping it out. So as far as what that actually means, I mean, the, the intent of the statute is still being met with regard to, uh, you know, holding the, the water back just long enough to get the pollutants out of it and then releasing it in a timely manner. But if the, if the only difference is if this is going to a pump versus gravity draining the on-surface facility, then, then I guess that's just an issue we need to figure out. Well, if it's not, if it's not protected under the statute, then what do we do? with it because I think that there are quite a few of those and I think that people have been thinking up to this point that they actually are protected under the statute and I, I have been party to, to that uh, understanding. Ah. So I, I don't know, I think it's Dan, you, go ahead. Dan asked an excellent question that will warrant some further follow-up. Yeah, there you go. So we'll, we'll uh, hash this out with the state engineer and see if we can come up with something that makes sense for everyone. The next question I have is from Patrick O'Connell in Jefferson County, and Patrick asks, was there thought to not require BMPs, including PLDs, which are ring gardens, related to single-family dwellings on larger lots? So, you know, during the legislative process, Patrick, there was a lot of talk about putting in limits, so if something was smaller than a certain size, the notification wouldn't be required. Uh, but in, in the case of a PLD, which is also known as a rain garden, there is no notification requirement regardless of whether it's on a single family lot or, or a commercial lot or regardless of the size of it. So I hope that that solves the dilemma because you don't, you're not required to provide notification for it regardless. A, uh, a pair, and, and did, I, I don't want to be jumping to the next question without Carl and Holly having the opportunity to give input on that one. But a, a, a parallel, I think you're good. Okay. A parallel question is, Does is a rain garden required to have an underdrain in order to still qualify as a non-retention BMP? And the answer to that is no. It does not need to have an underdrain, but it does need to, the water that's on the surface needs to vanish from the surface within uh, 72 hours for the five-year storm. So as long as, and, and rain gardens are typically designed to infiltrate into the media within 12 hours. 
So if the, if the first foot of storage goes into media in 12 hours and the access is spilling over uh, an outlet box in the emergency spillway is flood, is flood control, then no wonder drain would be required. Okay, the, the next question from Al Quintana is, what about a detention pond that is being used as a sediment pond during construction? Does this pond not need to be in the portal until it is removed as a sediment pond and is finalized as detention? And Al, I would say in the case of a sediment pond that is going to become a 100-year or, or a permanent uh, BMP and, and possibly flood control as well, that you can enter into the database during construction or you can wait until after construction. It is technically during construction a construction BMP, so there's no requirement for you at that point to enter it into the database. But before it becomes operational in its final configuration, it does need to be in. So I'll leave that up to you as to whether you put it in during construction or not. But, but I would not put it in as a temporary uh, plan. Okay, the next question is from Carrie Powers. Carrie is asking, why are temporary and water quality options for the design listed in the portal? Um, that, Carrie, is because we have not updated the portal since we received the state's memorandum two weeks ago. So we need to update the portal. I do have our, our programmer extraordinaire on the on the line. Tom Near is is the mastermind behind the compliance portal, and, and he can do this sort of thing in a cinch. So we will modify the compliance portal to modify that drop down to get rid of the temporary. I wanted to have this conversation first, and I, I wasn't sure whether there'd be a lot of pushback from the community. It, I don't know, I really don't know how to feel, and that's why we're having this webinar. So it's your opportunity to say, say you know, what you want the portal to look like. So I appreciate your comment. Okay, so Dan Mogan, it comes back to clarify his underground detention not in a vault. Uh, specifically, as an example, what if the detention storage is in the void space in porous, a porous paver system? Uh, a porous paver system is a non-retention permanent BMP, so it, there's no notification required for that. Okay, the next question is Suzanne Corduroy with CSU up in Fort Collins. The copy of the FAQ document I have indicates on the last page that the statute applies to rain gardens and sand fillings. Has this changed? Yes, absolutely, it has changed. That uh, that FAQ that I put out in October of last year needs to be updated, and I will do that right after this this webinar. So this webinar is to tell you straight straight from Carlin's mouth what the new state engineers' guidance looks like, so you understand it from them, and then I will include that and also the questions that are being asked today in this webinar will include those in the FAQ. So there will be an updated FAQ that comes out of this webinar today. Thanks for your question. Okay, Derek Glosson asked the question, should we wait until the pond is constructed before registering on the portal? Some pond designs are approved but never constructed. Sand, oh, I'm sorry, that's the end of this question. So, um, yeah, I'd wait. If you're not sure that it's going to be built, I wouldn't put it on the portal. You're supposed to provide notification before it becomes operational. I think there's a little bit of a grace period built into that. Um, the, the compliance part of this new state statute is operating on the honor system, and I think we've done a marvelous job of, 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 of being honest and, and, and putting all these things on on the portal. You saw how many of us have put these facilities on the portal. So um, we're doing a good job and if you don't get the thing posted until it's been operational for a day or two, I think that's not the end of the world. Excuse me, just a minute. <coughs> okay, Scott Leaker is asking the question, 
Sand filter and rain gardens are considered non-retention BMPs if there is only a WQCV, correct? So if there's 100-year detention on top of the sand filter or on top of the rain garden, um, would, would you not consider that? Would you not have to put that in the notification? And, and my answer, and Holly, tell me what you think, but I would say at that point it becomes, it falls into this on the, on the uh, memorandum that's out that falls into the category of a flood detention basin. Right. So I would say yes, you do need to provide notification um, for that. There are other issues with putting 100 year detention on top of a rain garden or on top of a sand filter that have to do with pollutant loading during these extreme events that make them problematic. But for the compliance purpose, uh, the answer is yes. You would, you would definitely want to provide notification for that. All right, I am running out of questions, so if you have not asked a question, please do so at this point. If you want me to, and I see some people have, I see a hand up. Dan Johnson has a hand up, so Dan, I'm just going to unmute you. Can you hear me? Dan, can you hear me? Nope, I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just... Okay, I'm gonna I'm going to remute Dan Johnson because I believe I asked him if he could hear me and he said no, I can't. So I don't know I don't know how to respond to that. Um, what would you like me? Those 66 of you in the audience, what would you like me to do now? Do you want me to to go to the compliance portal and show you some examples of things that um, confuse me? Because I know there are a lot of things on the compliance portal that. Uh, that are confusing. I could probably just randomly select one. There's one in Littleton or Beaumont. And I don't mean to, to call anyone out. There's, there's uh, you know, it, these things aren't easy. So this is in Beaumont, or not in Beaumont. It looks like it's in Inglewood. I see a facility at 2690 Union. It's a 100-year facility. Uh, the ponding area is 0 0.053 acres. I'm going to look at the attachment, and I'm going to see um, so this is a, a very small facility. The, uh, the area of the watershed is only 1.2 acres and the facility is only a foot deep. Excuse me, just a minute. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry for that. Uh, it's an extended detention basin, it appears to be. And uh, looking at the output table, it appears to, to detain the water quality capture volume for 0 0.7 hours and the 100 year for 1.3 hours with the five year being detained for one hour. So I think that this workbook works better for some, some types of uses than others and that's something that I'd like to improve its usability. And I think the problem occurs when you have a very small facility and you don't have a lot of data points in the, in the input table that it, it gets, it gets hard for it to work. Although this, this actually, when you look at the graph, it looks like it's doing a good job of reducing the, uh, the flood events and the water quality is a little reduced at all, but at least it's been possibly had back in the world. So that's just a, a random observation of the facility. Um, another example I could show you is, zoom in a little bit, and again, I, I appreciate it if you, if you don't get mad at me for showing your facility. Um, here's one way up in the mountains. This is the uh, town of Aspen, city of Aspen. It's a rain garden. So now with the new information that we have, we actually wouldn't need to put this rain garden in. Uh, and there are a lot of them in there now, and I think we'll just leave them in there. They will fade away after 90 days, and I will adjust the portal to get rid of the drop down for water quality. Well, I, I guess I can't remove the water quality because extended detention is water quality only, so I can't actually get rid of that, but I will get rid of the temporary. Um, I'll show the details on this Aspen rain garden, and I guess the problem with this one is that there, really, there is no data sheet that's uploaded with it. So in order to comply with the notification part of the state statute, you need to tell the water rights holders who are on the state's water supply, substitute water supply email list, you need to tell them 
think there's four pieces of information they need. They need uh, the name of the facility, they need the location of the facility, they need the ponding area of the facility itself at its design uh, capacity. And the last thing that they that is required to give them is data, our data, I should say, Jill, our data that demonstrate that the, the facility fills up and drains out within the time frames that are specified in the statute. So without the data sheet, which is missing in this case, you're really not complying with the statute. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's irrelevant because it's a rain garden. That's interesting. As a rain garden, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be notified anymore. Ken, there's another question. Um, if someone enters a, a permanent water quality facility into the portal and then in the future decides to modify it, um, for exa example, enlarge it, can we go in and edit or should we enter a new facility? Thank you, Holly. And thank you, Al Gross. That's a good question. So I just accidentally signed out. Let me, DDS Digital Data Services is the firm that Tom Muir works with and uh, it is our, our programmer on this project has done a really marvelous job. So I sign in as a local jurisdiction and I go to the facility in question and I want to modify it later on. So I click on it and because you have, because Al, you have uh, administrative privileges associated with your jurisdiction, you can edit it. You just click on edit facility and you can you can edit the attributes, which is the size of it, the location, the name of it. You can add additional attachments. You can remove the attachments that are on there, which you'd want to do if you had, if you were enlarging them. So yeah, all of these things are very easy to do to the existing facility. And it looks like Greg, we started to ask a question. Go on and finish your question, Greg. A couple of things that I just want to point out, not that I want to encourage everyone to, to jump on this bandwagon, but there have been some situations where we had to make special accommodations to certain entities. And one of them, it, it, since Al asked that question, I'll, I'll point him out. CDOT is, is clearly a very special entity because they're, in order to build this compliance portal, we use shape files for each one of your jurisdictions. And so that you at the, the local um, cities and, and counties and towns, the, the engineering staff, the development review staff, could have editorial privileges for everything within your jurisdiction. We couldn't do that with CDOT because CDOT's jurisdiction is the entire state. And we didn't want we didn't want to have overlapping editorial authority. So for CDOT, we created uh, and now maybe you'll have to remind me exactly how we did this. But I think that what we did was we created an email an email address for so that all of the all the facilities have to be uploaded through one email address. And a similar situation with Suzanne Corduroy at CSU up at Fort Collins. CSU is a non-standard MS4 within the city of Fort Collins, and CSU has their own facilities that they have control over, not the city. So it was important to both the city of Fort Collins and CSU to differentiate between the two. So we added a special shapefile for, for CSU in for, for Fort Collins campus, which, uh, which was a means of accommodating their, their special needs. So we can do that if you have a, a similar situation. And we have some more questions showing up, but before we answer this, one other thing I wanted to mention was um, when we started out this project, we didn't really know how we were going to tackle it, and different communities have done it different ways. Denver, for example, likes to upload all of the facilities themselves, and, and I think that's fine. And many other communities are letting the developers upload the facilities, and then they just give them a, a quick check and accept them. For those, for those communities that are accepting facilities from engineers, from development engineers, I've seen a few of them, in fact, I, I encourage this, uh, 
a few communities are requiring the, that an engineer put his stamp or her stamp on the printout of that workbook before uploading it so that they have a permanent record of who the engineer was that designed the facility in case there's a problem in five years or ten years and that engineer no longer works at that firm or that firm is no longer in business. So I think that's I think that's a good way to handle it if you're having development engineers upload. I'd like to see them stamp on that workbook but you know, I think that's that's good. So so there's a question, there's a couple questions about um, if you have an underground facility, it doesn't have a surface area. And I would say that it does have a surface area, really. For every depth that you're ponding underground, that would be associated with the area that's that's ponding. If it's a vault, then it's it's associated with the area of that vault. One thing I want to clarify because I think it was confusing and, and it's really maybe something that's not clear in the memo. Um, going back a couple questions, if you have a permanent flood control basin, um, that is something that needs to be entered into the portal. The question came in if you have a permeable pavement section that has flood control detention under the pavement section, um, that's a that's a BMP, but it's flood control. Um, it's probably safest at this point to go ahead and enter that into the to, to the portal. So in that case, you would have a surface area that would be reduced by your your void space, if that makes sense. So you have an area of aggregate that you're ponding water, and for a typical aggregate, that would be the void space would be 0.4 or something similar to that, so your your surface area would be reduced by that void space. Um, another question, um, and I think Ken just answered the PE stamped issue. Um, it's it not, appears, it's, or did you? It's certainly not required. But I think yeah. I think it's a great idea. I, when I when I saw that some communities were doing it, I thought that that makes a lot of sense. Why not? It's just like any any other submittal they have. Someone should put a stamp on it. Okay. The, the next question is: It appears that external applicants are able to submit facilities and receive automatic approval. It was our understanding that an approval notice would be required by the land use agency. I'm going to let you answer that one, Ken. Okay, thanks, Holly. So, and this is David Vandell, and thank you, David. The, um, the short answer is you have 30 days to either approve the facility or delete the facility. And so these, these facilities that you see on the map that are green are facilities that have been put there by develop, the development community and are awaiting acceptance by the local jurisdiction. And they're already visible to the general the general user, although the general user, the, the subscribers to the state's email list, will not receive notification about the green facilities. If they stay green for 30 days, and at the end of 30 days, they are automatically accepted into the database. And we had to select some time frame for that to happen. And if you disagree with 30 days, let me know. And we can maybe extend that to a longer period of time. But remember, they're only they're only visible in the database for 90 days. The whole purpose of this of this map is to provide notice to those water rights holders who are on the state substitute water supply email list. So it's our responsibility to give them timely notice. Um, if we have them if if we have them on for 90 days, and then you like like I said, David, if if 30 days you don't think is enough time. Let me know. We can maybe extend that for for your community. Um, happy to happy to talk it out. And then one more question um, on the design worksheet. When you have BMPs in series, how would you complete the stage storage table? For instance, rooftop detention in series with an EDB. 
and this is Jim Turner with City and County Denver. Thanks for the question, Jim. That's that's a tough one. That's going to require um, you're going to have to probably do some work outside of the compliance workbook to to generate a stage area and a stage discharge table that you then would put into the compliance workbook. Now, rooftop detention. Um, is that water quality detention? Is that flood control detention? I'm not. I'm not sure how that how that actually looks. If it's uh, it's that's a that's a special case, and it's going to require some special engineering. So I go ahead. Paul. I was just going to add. Typically, that kind of scenario, it's going through a water quality BMP, um, and then going into more of a flood control facility. So I believe that all the requirements for drain times are really associated with the five year, hundred year, that your your water quality BMP, although that is part of the volume. Yeah, I think Ken's right, you're gonna have to do a little bit of work outside of, of the workbook to determine what your 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 total drain times are for for each of those events? Right, and I I guess without knowing more about it, I would suggest doing a separate creating them treating them as two separate facilities. You have a rooftop detention, which maybe is extended detention, and then you have a flood control detention base. And if you if you treated those as two separate facilities, I think that would be all right. Another question, the memo stage shall not be released for subsequent diversion or storage by the owner. Doesn't that prohibit these facilities being placed in series? And I'll, I'll take a crack at that. The um, intention related to that release is about these facilities being used and timed so that this water is available for specific diverters of water rights. Um, we have no problem with these facilities being constructed in series. And as we define these facilities in the memo, they can either be one, seri one facility or a series of facilities. Um, we're just looking at what's going on overall on site. Um, our interest is that it's not, you know, there aren't batch releases to meet a specific water right. That's, that's not the intention of these facilities from our perspective. Does that answer that? Yeah, I think that's I think yeah. that's a good answer. So we're not we're not considering a beneficial use of the water further treatment or being drained into another basin for flood control or for water quality. It's really don't don't be irrigating the, the grassy areas around your detention basin with the water out of the detention basin. That would be uh, in direct violation with water rights administration. <clears throat> Right. Right. And here's one from Keith. No, I'm sorry. There's another one that I think we missed. Um, How would snouts and sediment basins be viewed? Looks like the next one. So snouts are just a um, would not be entered in the to the portal. And sediment basins, we talked about this. That's really considered a construction BMP. So that would not be required to be uploaded to the portal. Good, good. Here's one from David Van Dellen, but I think we skipped a little bit ago. Oh, how, do, how do we demonstrate compliance with the groundwater rule? Does the engineer need to certify, submit soil boring logs, or is this up to the local jurisdiction? Um, um, go ahead. Go ahead. We don't have any you know, direct action that needs to be completed to demonstrate compliance. I think it's more going to be if if it hasn't rained in two weeks and there's water in the detention pond, it's going to, someone's going to start asking some questions and then it may be, you know, looked at a bit further. Um, that, I think that's more where we, where we come into play on those. Right, good. So if, if you, when they construct this facility, if they hit groundwater, you're going to know it. And, and when that happens, you have a problem that you need to solve, or the developer has a problem that they need to solve, because this is not only is this no longer protected 
that's a double negative, sorry, under the statute, but it actually requires, you, you, you need to mitigate the consumptive loss of the fluid by exposing that groundwater. So it's it's not it's not the norm. I, it happens now and then, and when it does, you need to, to address it either by filling in the bottom part of the detention basin or otherwise um, treating it. Uh, the next question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, would it be possible to get a summary matrix of the treatment BMPs listed in Volume 3, fact sheets T1 through T11, and clarify if they are considered retention, detention, non-retention? Um, I, I think I need a clarification on this question because what we're presenting today is a memo from from the state and and um, what we have in volume three I'm not sure if you're asking for us to add something in volume three or if you're asking which would be asking urban drainage for something or if you're asking for a memorandum uh, a, a revised memorandum right. I think, um, it, and I'll, I'll give my two cents as to how I interpret it Pete's question is that um, he would like clarity in a, in a revised FAQ as to which one of these, which of these facilities require notification and which don't, and, and what is, are they considered retention, detention, or non-retention, and, and that's certainly something we can put in the FAQ, Pete, and if that doesn't answer the question that you asked, please just let us know and we'll, we'll get to the bottom of it, but I definitely see how in the FAQ it would be very helpful to know specifically what in volume three requires notification and what does not. I'd like to add to that as well. I, I think a lot of it comes back to intent. Um, we have some examples of what does need to be noticed and what does not. Um, clearly our, our language isn't going to be able to encompass absolutely everything. But what we're talking about here are, are systems that you're designing to permit, to purposely hold back water from the system to slow the water for quality or quantity purposes, um, but not to store it permanently. There are many ranges of BMPs and series of BMPs you can be using. And as needed, we can work to clarify some of those, but really that intent Attention um, beyond the specific definitions provided in here are that you're you're purposely detaining water for a period of time um, for as and building a permanent structure to do it. Good. Thank you. The next question is: Has there been any issues with the release from basins being over detained due to under detained discharge so I'm not aware of uh, anyone running into problems with this but it, it really just comes down to determining how long you're holding water right and going right. through it, it's just going to depend on on the basin, but I haven't seen it as a problem. Right. That, you haven't either, Ken. No, I haven't. The over over detaining for an undetained to compensate for an undetained area. When you when you talk about that, you're typically talking about flood control, and not water quality, and flood control uh, does it is rarely if ever exceeds the 72 hour limit for the five year event so it, it typically falls well within that time frame okay and then we have go ahead another question from bruce when when is the facility considered operational if the pond has been excavated and the plate is installed but the volume of design may not have been substantiated, is it okay to hold off on considering it operational until volume is confirmed? I'm going to answer, sure, Bruce. <laughs> 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 I, 
You bet. You know, it's 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 uh, as I said, this the compliance portal is honor system. We're honoring that system by by doing the best we can. And uh, and whether I, I think it's good to have some hard numbers so you don't have to go back and edit it right away. So I would say, yeah, wait until you know to, to have the right information. Uh, you know, technically it's it's operational when water's coming into it, rainfall's coming into it, and it's holding water back and releasing it. So I wouldn't wait months or, or years to do that, but I would certainly certainly wait until you have the right information. And Ryan Banning comes back with a, a follow-up on his snout question. So apparently these manhole snouts actually have a sump underneath the snout. And, and Carlin, I don't even, I don't know if you even know what we're talking about. About now, this is a water quality device that's inside a manhole, and it's a trash remover basically. That's what it's good for, and it relies on having apparently three or four inches of standing water in the bottom of the manhole in between storms. And I, I certainly hope the state engineer is not going to send out the manhole to the state to have three inches of standing water in the manhole. So, I would have a hard time seeing us doing that, yeah. Right? And I don't think there are more than a dozen snouts statewide. So I, I think I think we're okay with that. <clears throat> What parties are able to access facilities that are archived after 90 days? So I think that's just the jurisdictions that have a login. That's right. You need to have editorial privileges to see those sites. Uh, if you are a development engineer and you want to, to get information on the site that is no longer visible on the portal, you can certainly send me an email and I will retrieve that information for you. Uh, but if you're with a local community, you have the login name and the and the password. And once you log in, you can turn on the archive layer and see all of them. And they'll be there forever as long as the portal is active. If someone notices, someone on the notification email notices a facility holding water longer than what is allowed, it may be needing maintenance or something is not working properly, I'm going to add maybe it's designed improperly, what happens? Will they notify the owner agency or urban drainage? I, I know the answer is not to notify urban <laughs> drainage. <laughs> Beyond that, I guess we don't care so much. <laughs> no, the, uh, the, the, the goal is, because each one of these facilities has, if you notice when I click on a facility, like this one up here in Brighton, it looks like, let me zoom in a little bit, so I'll click on this facility, and I'll look at the details of this Brighton facility, and I see here, uh, A. Marler at j3engineering.net is the, is the engineer of record for this facility, so if I have an issue with this facility, I would hope that that this is this is how it would work would be that I would go to that person. What's more likely, I think, to happen is that the the um, person complaining about the facility is going to go to the local jurisdiction and complain to them, which is fine because the local jurisdiction has access to the same information and uh, and can get back to that, and then a Marler can um, can deal with the the irate. I read water right holder. It's important to note that, and, and, and Carlin brought, brought part of this up earlier, she said, just because you are showing compliance when you put these facilities into a compliance database does not take you off the hook for perpetual maintenance of these facilities. And I know that almost all of you are MS4 permit used, at least on the, on the local, local government side, and you're all ready to require to provide maintenance for these, but it's important that these be maintained in a manner that they continue to operate as they were designed to operate. And if they don't, then you're not, you're not protected under the statute. Uh, the other and, side, and go ahead. Oh, that's, you're just in agreement, and that's when, you know, a neighbor may call our office wondering why there's a permanent pond next door, and that's, you know, when you might have a water commissioner contact you asking what what the facility is doing. Good. Thank you. All right. Are we at the end of our list? I think so. 
All right, well, let's see. It is, uh, it's a little bit after three, so we've been doing this now for an hour and eight minutes. So I think that if you have any other questions, I would like you to send them to me in an email, and I will include them in the FAQs. And in the meantime, I want to thank Carlin Armstrong with the State Engineer's Office for putting together what I think is an excellent memorandum describing the new view on the, the Water Rights Administration. I also want to thank my partner and colleague, Tisa, and all of you that came and, and sat through this presentation. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks, Ken. Bye-bye.